Hello again, and thanks for tuning in to another Home Hint from Border Home Inspections. Today I want to talk about something that is very complicated. It's hard to do uh, a good job of doing a video on this topic, but people have been calling me in recent months and even the last few years, for many years in fact, and asking me if I could help them because they think their house might have mold. Now, mold is something that is very misunderstood. In fact, if you think about it, it's even hard to figure out how to spell mold. Is it M-O-U-L-D or is it M-O-L-D? I don't know. I'm not going to get into it. In fact, I, I spell it M-O-L-D, but uh, maybe that's right. Maybe it's wrong. Maybe it's right for some people, wrong for other people. And that's really a lot uh, of what you get with mold itself. Sometimes it affects some people and it doesn't affect other people. So... I want to delve into it a little bit today and just give you my understanding of it. And as you can see, I'm not even sure how to spell it, so I'm obviously not an expert. But I do know a lot about the process of checking for mold in your house. And I start with an interview on the phone to try to determine if you are even a type of candidate that might have mold in your house. So there's often other reasons for people for, to, to be sick oftentimes. So uh, I try to be upfront and honest before I even take a visit to the house. But this video is going to explain what I do when I get to the house and how I go through the process of trying to help people understand if their house has mold in it or not. Today's video, so let's get started. I want to start by talking about the weather because it's the weather that actually causes a lot of our molds. So the snow that we have on the ground has mold in it. Um, it's, it's worse some days than others. When it's really, really cold outside, you don't have as much mold floating around in the air as you would maybe in a rainstorm. Um, so it, it's important to understand what's going on in your environment, not just necessarily in your house, for instance. So here you can see where Christmas is gone and you know, it's, I hope it's spring is coming, but we still got a bit to go yet before that happens. But when that does happen, you're going to start experiencing things like snow melt on your roof that is going to turn to ice. In my case, I have a metal roof, so it's not going to be so critical for me because that water is going to run off. But if you have an asphalt roof and you have an older home that doesn't have any soft venting, then you might experience some ice damming. And that ice damming will work its way down into your wall and, you know, you could have mold. Sometimes you don't see the mold, other times you do. So I want to talk about all that kind of stuff. I'm going to, again, this is going to be an in-depth video talking about lots of different things, showing you some of the processes that I use and a lot of people use, but it's not the be all and end all. There's so much to talk about. I just, it would be hours and hours, even knowing what I know to tell you everything I know, but uh, that's only just a small drop in the bucket of, of what there is to know out there. My point of the video is to try to help you understand what mold is, how it develops, and of course, how we avoid it. If you can avoid it, you're not going to call me. And that's fine with me. There's still enough people out there that will do things they shouldn't be doing, causing mold to happen. Most of the time, the mold happens from, through no fault of our own, but sometimes it's avoidable. Oftentimes, mold will start in areas where you can't see it. And it grows and it gets to the point where it's severe enough that it breaks off and it floats around in the air. You breathe it in and it makes you sick or it doesn't make you sick. That's the funny part about mold is somebody might get sick, but the next person might not. When it comes to the weather affecting how mold grows, a lot of times what's happening is because we live in Canada, we live in an environment where the outside temperatures can vary from plus 40 to minus 40. Our houses are built and designed to take it, but any little flaw in, in the, like a fly in the ointment, can cause moisture problems. So I want to point out one thing that a lot of people don't realize is, if you don't have moisture, then you don't have mold. Mold will only grow where areas are moist. And then there are certain substrates that mold doesn't like to grow on. It doesn't like to grow on fiberglass insulation, for instance. Um, or plastic or concrete but it likes to grow on things like drywall and uh, plywood even um, 
not so much wood, more so plywood and that sort of thing. But it'll pretty much grow on anything if you've got enough debris and uh, air pollutants, so to speak, sitting on the surface. And, and that area gets moist, uh, it will grow the mold. So a couple of other factors about mold that you might not know. One would be that the most molds that we have to deal with in Canada here require about 16 to 20 percent moisture content before they actually get a foothold and start growing. And if there's anybody out there that wants to contradict any of this stuff, that's fine. I'd say do a long form video of your own and do more detail and explain this better than I can. Because again, I'm not an expert, but I'm just trying to give you my understanding of it and how I approach it in my business. So 16 to 20 percent moisture content and then it needs a substrate to grow on. Again, if it's got uh, drywall or cardboard or anything like that. So that's something else. So the other thing that it needs is it needs about 48 hours of that wet, humid um, time frame to get, start, get started. The, another thing it needs is it needs temperature. It needs a warmer temperature. So if it's frozen, it won't grow. Um, I honestly don't know the actual temperature. I think maybe 10 degrees and higher. Uh, but look it up. And that, again, this is just an information video. It's not designed to say, oh, I'm, an, I'm a mold expert. I can tell you everything you ever want to know. I, I'm not. But these are just a few factors that I do know of. Um, what else does it need? Uh, so it needs moisture. It needs temperature. It needs some time. And oftentimes mold will grow not necessarily on the first time something has been wet, but it grows oftentimes when something's been wet repeatedly. So for instance, if you had the ice on the roof here, uh, melting and coming down into your wall cavity, it gets wet and it stays wet. Then it gets cold. It turns to frost or ice in the wall. And then it thaws out on a warm day like today. Uh, so you got these cycles of freeze thaw cycles happening all the time. And it, it will grow in the wall that way or on the floor in the basement if you've got a leaking faucet inside the house or um, a leaking toilet or anything like that. So it needs all of those things. So if you can eliminate some of those things, which we often can, then you can eliminate the mold growth in the first place. If you find mold, then you have to say to yourself, okay, what are the factors that's caused it? And what can I do to, to get rid of some of the factors that are leading to this problem? Oftentimes it is something as simple as changing a downspout on the outside of the house because it's draining next to the house and the water's coming in next to your foundation. It gets in behind the drywall and it doesn't take very much moisture. It can't dry out fast. So after 48 hours, the mold starts to set in because it's got what? Moisture, temperature, and time, and a substrate. So, you know, the best thing you can do is avoid, to avoid all of this is get that downspout away. You know, sometimes maybe it won't work, but a lot of times it will work. And uh, it's better to be proactive than it is to be reactive. So now that we talked a little bit about mold and what it needs to grow and stuff like that, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about something that most of you will never use me for because I realize that most people watching my videos are not my customers. Uh, I like to do this just to help people, right? So two things that I do. One thing I do is... I can go to your house and I can do a mold inspection. So I look through the whole house. I check the attic space. Sometimes I even get on the roof looking for leaks. Uh, one of the biggest things I'm looking for is moisture, right? If you don't have moisture, then you don't have mold. Now, it's not just current moisture, but it could be past moisture, right? Uh, or hidden moisture. So I use my thermal camera and my moisture meter, tools that are not foolproof, but they're a lot better than just the human eye. So all these things together can help me to give you a report that says, oh, I think you got a wet basement or this wall in the basement is wet and it's possible that there could be some mold in that basement. Um, behind the wall, we can't see it, but it could be there. So that's what I refer to as my mold inspection. Then the other thing that we could do is let's say I find an area that I think is wet uh, you could either investigate just by cutting open the drywall and so on, not while I'm there, but after the fact. Or you could say, well, let's see if there's actually mold in the air. So that's the second thing that we can do. We can take a special tool, 
It's called, it's basically a, an aero cell cartridge. And we draw air through that cartridge and in a measured way. And we can send that sample, that cartridge back to the lab and they say, okay, we're comparing the outside air to the inside air and these are the results. So I'm going to show you how I go about doing that process um, and give you a better understanding of things that you should do when, when doing air samples, things that you should be aware of when you're doing air samples. So if the mold sample is, you know, ex extensively higher inside than outside, then it might come back as elevated. Uh, if it's slightly elevated inside than outside, they might say it's normal. It, they know, like the lab has done millions and millions of these samples and they actually compare it to the area that you're taking the sample. So in my case, I they request you to put in the postal code so that they can say, okay, we've had you know, 10,000 samples taken in that area in the last 20 years and the numbers have been roughly this. And if they see numbers that are way out of whack, they'll either let me know or they will uh, say that there's something going on here you need to investigate further. So it, it's not a really complicated process, but it's complicated enough that, you know, they're trying to help determine if there is a problem, if there isn't a problem. Uh, it's really important not to mix the numbers up. So if, if you have a number outside that's like 10 spores, and you have a, a number inside that's 50 spores, well, you could easily say that, 50 spores is five times as much as 10 spores. So therefore, you have five times as much mold inside your house. And it, when that's, when you say that, it really scares people. And people think, oh my God, what am I going to do? You know, my house is full of mold. Well, 50 spores. You got to keep that in mind. And, and, you know, 50 spores, as I said, you could have 427, no problem on the outside. Um one of the things that the lab where I, you know, send my stuff to, they say 800 spores is the is the cutoff essentially of, of Aspergillus penicillin, and that's I keep mentioning that mold because, well, it's the one I can pronounce, and because it's pretty common. Okay, so if they see 800, then they say, well, it's high, but it's you know it might be okay. Let's take a look at the at everything else, all the extenuating circumstances, and then make a decision in the lab as to whether it's elevated or it isn't. Um, one other thing that can happen, if I take this sample inside here and it turns out that there's a whole lot of mold growing here and there's a couple of different types of mold inside the house that really shouldn't be in here. You always hear people talking about, oh, I got black mold because they see a piece of moldy drywall. They, oh, I got black mold. Well, what does that really mean? A lot of times what they're trying to, what people don't understand is there's all different colors of mold. And one of the types of mold that we see inside that we really shouldn't is stachybotrys. And that's how I say it, but somebody else might say it differently. Um, and another type of mold would be chitonium. Again, not saying, not sure I'm saying that right, but that's how I identify it. If the lab can look through this cartridge and find out that it is, in fact, um, more than a half a dozen or so spores of that type of mold, they're going to call it ele elevated. So again... We're 427 spores on the outside, and we come inside and we're only 100 spores on the inside. You'd think, oh, great. But of those 100, you got 27 spores of stachybotrys. It's elevated because stachybotrys is one of those molds that the human body does not like, and it will make most people sick. But it's also pretty rare, and you don't find it inside the house very often. So um, that's one situation where it would be elevated and you'd have to go looking for it to try to find out where it's so, at. To recap, that's the second part of the process. When we want to do a mold test inside of a house or an air test inside of a house, we have to have some means of comparing the air quality inside the house to the outside. So that's why what we do is we take a cartridge like this and it just has a little thin membrane. It's a sticky membrane right in the middle here. And what it does is it sucks air in through here from the outside air in a, in a well ventilated area and it basically whatever mold happens to be in the air the day that would do the sampling and it's important to understand that the air quality outside of a house on monday might be different than tuesday or on monday morning might be different than monday afternoon it really depends on the 
conditions outside. It depends on temperature. It depends on um, humidity in the air. It depends on whether it's windy or rainy. And all of those things should go into your report to help the lab understand what the air quality is doing that day. So let's say the outside air today, after I suck it into this cartridge, it gets to the lab and the lab splits it open it looks under it under a microscope and says the lab says that there's 427 spores inside the sample so and that's extrapolated so there's usually 150 liters of air goes through this cartridge and then they say well we'll extrapolate that out to be this many spores per cubic meter and of those 427 spores you're going to have let's say 80 percent of them to be aspergillus penicillin and then there's going to be three or four other types of mold, let's say, in there. And that's all written down in your report. This would be the outside sample. So that's the type of conditions that we're finding in the outside air on the day that the inspection was done. And you can see there's all kinds of different types of molds there. And then if you come over here, you can see that the second sample was taken on the main floor, bathroom. That's probably the area that the customer is concerned about. And these are the results that we got uh, in that area. And then finally, this area here was the basement. So uh, you can see the results here. Now, what's important is to look here and it says not elevated. Not elevated. So it's not that critical that you have mold spores. What's critical is how does the mold spores in each of these areas compare to the mold spores in the outside air? And you might find that some of these areas are higher. Uh, for instance, the outside air has 36 spores of Aspergillus penicillin. Again, if this had 44 or 54 even, wouldn't matter so much. Uh, it just doesn't necessarily mean that you have a mold problem if the mold spores inside your house are slightly higher than they are outside. All kinds of factors can play into this. So um, that's where you have to rely on the mycologist at the lab to determine, you know, what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable. And, and you know, they can be wrong, but uh, you get a better understanding than you would have without this air test. So now that we know that the air quality is not good inside the house based on the air sample, we have to determine where the problem is. And I just want to point out a few things about that process. So if it's a small area, uh, even uh, CMHC will tell you that you probably can fix it yourself. So if it's, let's say, two square feet and it's a, a wash machine is leaked in the basement, there's a little bit of black stuff on the drywall, you don't have to send it to a lab to know if it's mold or not. You can pretty much be sure that it's mold um, and it's probably not good. So you could potentially clean that up yourself. It's not a big area. It's no point in hiring a crew to come in there and charge you, you know, a lot of money. Um, so what you do in a small situation like that would be you would just take some, let's say, a garbage bag and you tape it onto the, the spot where the mold is. And then you would take a knife and you would cut that area out, put it into another garbage bag, take it upstairs, throw it in the dump, or wherever. Um, now, if it's a bigger area, let's say, like my brother-in-law just recently had a flood in his basement and, um, you know, it was a widespread area. You're going to want to hire a restoration company to, to fix that. And you want to get them in there quick. Because remember what you have, you have 48 hours before the mold will start to set into your carpets and your walls. Now the drywall is going to soak that moisture up and it has to be cut out essentially. And you have to do it, do a good job, but you want to make sure your vapor barrier is resealed at the end of the process. Uh, but bigger, more, more important than that, if you are not looking after yourself when you're taking this stuff out of your basement, I'm assuming it's a basement at this point, then you could be exposing yourself to a mold that you don't want to. It, the body is a funny thing. It can actually take and trigger, a mold, mold can trigger something within your body to start a reaction that might take months or years or never uh, to, to recover from. So you don't want to overexpose yourself to mold. And, um, you know, it's, it's expensive to hire the, the, the proper people to come in there because they're government regulated. They have to put on hazmat suits and they're exposed to the mold a lot. So as such, they have to 
protect themselves, of course. And all of that costs money, but it, it's all about your safety. So you want to make sure you do it well. If you want to watch a video that I did with uh, BioClean, um, basically we're discussing the topic of um, conflict of interest. So in this case, I would be the tester. You wouldn't want to hire me to do the restoration because I could... I have a vested interest, essentially. I could cheat and tell you you need to do something that you don't need to do. So try to keep the testing portion and the uh, restoration portion separate. Um, and that's just, that's just good advice. I mean, you can do what you want, but that's what I would recommend. And you can hire whoever you want. Um, but finally, you know, get this stuff taken out and restore it back to normal. But more than that, you've got to try to figure out what the problem is were what caused the problem in the first place if it was just a broken water line well you can't anticipate that that's just something that happens you know i always have this expression that the more you own the more you got to fix and these things happen you know bad things happen to good people all the time and it's really a first world problem because you got things that you own that you have to fix them so that's just the way it is but if you own things and you don't do any preventative maintenance you don't look after the downspouts outside your house or those sorts of things, you're going to have these problems more often and it's going to cost you more money. So my recommendation would be to be proactive again instead of reactive. So I'm hoping that uh, this video has been helpful to a few of you, help you understand how it is that we try to determine if there's mold, how I do it at least. Uh, someone else might do it totally different, but uh, this might give you somewhere to start at least. And if you're in my area, of course, I'd be happy to help you out. Uh, I might even talk you out of uh, some things on the phone. Like I said, being honest about this stuff is important. I, uh, people are suffering enough, right, if they've got uh, health issues for whatever reason. And uh, again, lots of times it's not mold. And uh, if I don't think it's mold, then, you know, I will probably encourage you to look elsewhere. Um, um, but sometimes you just want to, you know, cross all your T's and dot all your I's to, to make sure that you covered all your bases. So um, good luck out there. And I, I hope that uh, if you have a mold situation that it's easily re, uh, repairable and uh, you get it done well. So thanks for watching. And I hope to see you again on the next Home Hint from Border Home Inspection.